Welcome to the Rock of Ages Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Duke Backus. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit rockofagesaog.org. I believe that you're going to get a lot of out of it today, but it might be a little bit different than the way uh, I normally speak, but why don't we just let the Holy Spirit have His way, amen? This morning I've uh, entitled my message, On Earth As It Is In Heaven. I better make you laugh because you look too serious. There's this little old Christian lady living next door to an atheist. And every morning the lady comes out onto her front porch and she shouts, Praise the Lord! And the atheist yells back, There's no God! And she does this every morning with the same result. And as time goes on, the lady runs into this season of financial difficulty and she has some trouble buying food. And so she goes out onto the porch and she asks God for help with the groceries and then says, praise the Lord. And the next morning she goes out onto the porch and there's the groceries that she asked for. And of course she says, praise the Lord. And the atheist jumps out from behind a bush and says, Ha! I bought those groceries. There is no God. And the lady looks at him and smiles and she shouts, Praise the Lord! Not only did you provide for me, Lord, you made Satan pay for the groceries. (laughs) That's a good one. Got time for one more? Or two or ten? I don't know how many I got here. There was a kindergarten teacher, and, and she gave her class a show and tell. How many of you remember show and tell? Take something to school, and you had to explain what it was and what the significance was and all that stuff. And so she gives her class a show and tell assignment of bringing something to represent their religion. And so the first boy got in front of the class, and he says, My name is Benjamin. He says, And I'm Jewish, and this is the Star of David. And the second boy gets in front of the class, and he says, Uh, I'm sorry, a second girl gets in front of the class and says, my name is Mary. She says, I'm Catholic, and this is a crucifix. She holds it up for the class to see. And then another little boy gets in front of the class and says, my name is Tommy. I'm a Christian, and this is a casserole. (laughs) It's downloading. It's downloading for some of you. (laughs) All right. Maybe that one flew over your head. Okay. You got one more? All right, I got one more. A man told, tells his story, and he says this. He says, I was walking across a bridge one day, and I saw a man standing on the edge about to jump off. And he says, and I immediately ran over, and I said, stop, don't do it. Why shouldn't I, he said. I said, well, there's so much to live for. And he goes, like what? He goes, well, are you religious or are you atheist? He goes, religious. He goes, me too. He says, are you Christian or are you Jewish? He goes, Christian. He goes, me too. He goes, are you Catholic or Protestant? And he goes, he goes, Protestant. He says, me too. Are you Episcopalian or are you Baptist? And he says, Baptist. He goes, wow, me too. He goes, but are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? He goes, Baptist Church of God. Me too. He goes, but are you original Baptist Church of God or are you Reformed Baptist Church of God? He says, Reformed Baptist Church of God. Me too. He goes, but are you Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1879, or are you Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915? He says, Reformation, Baptist Church of God, 1915. To which he says, die, heretics, come. And he pushed him off. (laughs) I like that. That's good. I found a quote that says this. A lot of church members who are singing, standing on the promises, are just sitting on the premises. A lot of church members who are singing, standing on the promises, are just sitting on the premises. I'd like to share a message with you that's been on my heart this past week. And uh, I don't normally have a shortage for words. But this one's a little bit different for me because I felt the Lord absolutely just burden my heart with this. And so... 
the burden is this. It's simply to say to see the church live out the, willing, the will of God according to the prayer that Jesus prayed on earth as it is in heaven. To see the body of Christ walk in the authority and in the power of God according to scripture and according to that prayer that Jesus prayed on earth as it is in heaven. Churches all across America are doing their thing and they're doing their best to get people inside of the walls of a church with all kinds of things, free coffee, you know, donuts, you know, get a free Bible if you show up, the people will greet you, they'll be nice, uh, they'll, they'll do all kinds of stuff. And, and, and sometimes they're putting, you know, gimmicks before a God. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And I believe that sometimes what they're trying to do is they're trying to get people in the church under a false pretense. And, and so this looks like attending church for entertainment rather than being the church that brings the encounter of Jesus to a lost world. Amen? There's a big difference. If you came here to get entertained today, well, sadly, I'm not a movie star or neither am I a rock star. But I'm just a person that knows Jesus. And so if you're here to be entertained, maybe your entertainment value, uh, my entertainment value just dropped in your eyes. But the truth is, is I didn't gather here today and I pray that you're not here today to be entertained, but you're here to encounter the almighty living God. Amen. I recently saw a petition that is being signed to change the definition of the church from being known as a facility or building and being redefined as the body of Christ. Not only do I think that this petition is timely in nature, but I also believe this church, that this petition should be a wake-up call for the church. Because if we are defined it in, in dictionaries as a building, then we're probably representing the gospel wrong. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And what was the church? The church is the living body of Christ. Amen. It's those of you that have said, I believe in this gospel. I have this Jesus living in my heart and he's burning in my heart so much that I become a witness to this world wherever I go. How many of you know this Jesus that I'm talking about? And it's not just a thing that we are, a place that we are called to gather, but rather we are called to be a people that take this Jesus that we know to a lost and dying world. Paul says this in the word of God, he didn't come with eloquent speech or fancy words. But he came and he preached the gospel with a demonstration of the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2 and 4 says, my message and my words were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Everywhere that Jesus went church, he demonstrated the power of God. How many of you have read the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when you read these stories about Jesus, all we see is Jesus bringing the realm of heaven to earth. Amen? All we read about are people being healed. All we read about are people that were maybe once demon-possessed, and now they are delivered. We read about people that had no sight, but now they see. We read about people that, that had closed ears, but now they can hear. So wherever Jesus went, he walked with the authority and, the, and he brought the authority of heaven with him to earth. This is why he was, he was sought after. This is why he was somebody that people were attracted to. This is why there was crowds of thousands of people that followed him wherever he went because they saw something about his life that was completely different than the realm that they were used to experiencing on earth. They saw all of a sudden that the person that was, that was blind, the person that could not see, all of a sudden could see. They witnessed people that were demon-possessed, that were, that were angry, that were violent, that were you know, destructive. They witnessed people completely be set free. They saw all these things and all of a sudden people began to marvel and wonder and they said, Who is this Jesus? From what authority has he gotten this power? It would be a crazy thing to see in the church today this power explode. But you know what? That might actually push some people out because they might be afraid of what they've seen. Matthew chapter 8, if you know your Bibles, you'll find it at the end of Matthew chapter 8 around verses 26 through, through 29, I believe it is. Now I don't have it on the screen for you, but in Matthew chapter 8, the Bible says that there was two demon-possessed men. And it talks about how Jesus was 
was moving about and he encounters these two demon-possessed men. And when he encounters these, these demon-possessed men, all of a sudden these, these demons have to flee, okay? There was this authority that Jesus carried that had to push them out, amen? Do you believe in this authority that I'm talking about? So this Jesus walks up and he encounters these two men that have a spirit that has had them possessed. They cannot get the spirit off of their life by themselves. They cannot remove this. They cannot take medication. They can't do anything. But the only way the spirit was going to come out was if it met the hand of the living God. So Jesus encounters these two men and he casts out the spirit with authority. He says, let them go. And the moment that he casts out the spirit from these men, all of a sudden they're set free and they're delivered. Amen? They're completely healed. They went from being violent and gnashing of their teeth and foaming at the mouth and being destructive to all of a sudden being back to normalcy. And there was this normalcy that came over them and they looked just like normal people again. And guess what the city did? The city kicked Jesus out. They said, hold on a second, this is too weird. This... This, Jesus, I don't know what you just did, but we're used to seeing those guys foaming at the mouth. We were used to seeing those guys be, be completely violent and possessed. The Bible says that people had to walk around them because they were so messed up. And all of a sudden, Jesus brings heaven to earth, and they're set free. And all of a sudden, it was a realm that nobody had experienced. They said, Jesus, get out of here. This is weird. The question of the hour that I have for the church today is this, is are you so conditioned with the pain and the suffering and the disease and the things that this world has shown us that when the miraculous happens, you, you shut away, you say, oh, well, well that's, that's too weird. I'm used to seeing people in bondage. I'm used to hearing of the reports of pain. I'm used to hearing people say, oh, well, this person got, got diagnosed with cancer. I guess that's just how it's going to be. There's an unsatisfaction in my heart today, church. Because I want to see the kingdom of heaven invade the church once again. Where the power of God moves in such a manner that every demon, every sickness, every disease bows once again to the name of Jesus. And I believe the Lord, church, is calling us back to a place of complete surrender to the Holy Spirit. I believe that the Lord is calling the church back to a place of demonstration above dissertation. See, we could talk about it all we want. I said we could talk about it all we want. But it's time that we experience it once again. You could talk to your coworker, you could talk to your colleague, you could talk to your neighbor over and over about this God that loves them. But they may never believe it until they witness and encounter the power of a living God. I'll share this story with you. I had a, a, an instance that happened a few weeks ago. I, I, I walked out of my house and I was out in the front and I was watering the grass or the plants or something. And I hear uh, some girls across the street um, who are practicing homosexuals. It's, it's no secret. They said, there he is. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> what did I do? And I'm kind of standing in my yard, and I could hear him because, you know, the street's not that far. And I hear him say something, and a young woman walks across the street. She goes, hi, I have a question for you. Are you a pastor? I said, yes, I am. And she says, well, I have, a, I, have a, I have a few questions, you know, about the, the church that you pastor. What kind of church is it? So it's a Christian church. Oh, okay. Um, is it a church that's, like, accepting? How many of you know where I'm going with this? I said, yes, it's a church that will accept and receive anybody in any condition, but we believe in the Savior's power that it won't leave them in that same way that they showed up. And I began to explain the word of God. I began to share some, some verses with her. I began to, to enlighten her. I said, this is exactly what the word says. It's not my word. It's not my message. It's what he said. It's God's truth. 
And as I began to witness to her, the Holy Spirit prompted me to remind her of, a, of another instance that happened with me. I went to a restaurant with my wife, and I've told some of you this before. I went to this restaurant, and I was with my wife, and we were at this restaurant. And as we were there at the restaurant, the, the Lord prompted me to, to, he gave me a word for the waitress. And, and that word was simply this, was that she was hiding behind uh, her smile, but she was really full of pain. And the Lord wanted me to, to tell this to her so that she could be set free and so she could cast that care upon the Lord and just be set free. I struggled with the idea of, of sharing this with her because I didn't know her and she didn't know me. Amen? And if I'm wrong, then I'm really going to look foolish. Some guy that she's serving you know, lunch is, is telling her that, that God told uh, you know, him to tell her something. And so the whole time I'm at the restaurant, I, I tell my wife, and, and Mandy says, well, are you going to tell her? I was like, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. And then I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, Holy Spirit, help me. I don't know what to say. So finally it came the time where we finished the meal. I get the ticket. I hand her the ticket. I, I, I gave her a generous tip. I, I paid the bill. And I said, um, I don't know how to say this, but I need to share this with you. I said, the Lord told me to tell you that you have been hiding behind your smile, but you're really full of pain. And I said, does this mean anything to you? And she broke down crying in the middle of the restaurant. And as she was weeping and as she was crying, I said, listen, the Lord told me to tell you to cast all of it upon him. She had you know, told me later that she had a relationship with God and that she was a believer, but she was just holding something inside and I didn't know what it was. But in that instant, she knew that I couldn't have known what she was going through. In that instant, she knew that I couldn't have had, you know, some kind of, you know, crystal ball to look inside of her life. That's not what it was. It was the Lord revealing something. And I want you to know something, church. The Lord is so powerful and his heart is so for people that he does. He never wants to see him. Uh, a lost. He never wants to see him hurt. How many of you remember the famous scripture where the Bible says that Jesus was overlooking the city of uh, Jerusalem and he's staring at them and he says, oh, how I long to gather you. He said, oh, how I long to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks. And the Bible says that Jesus wept over the city. His heart was for them. His heart was to see them delivered. His heart was to see them changed. His heart was to see them live from a place that, that didn't have them burdened, that didn't have them captive, that didn't have them bound, but that they were a place where they were completely free. This is the heart of God. This is the heart of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going uh, in our life, and he's inside of us, and he's revealing truth. He's letting things out, but the 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 Real catch is when you and I are, are those that are listening to the Holy Spirit and when we become obedient to act on what he says. If he says pray for somebody, you pray. If he says bless on somebody, you bless on them. Amen? Amen. This is what, the way the Holy Spirit works. And so I believe that the Lord is calling the church not just to talk the talk, but to walk the walk once again. I believe the Lord is calling the church to once again loosen heaven on earth. I believe the Lord is calling the church once again to take up the authority that he has given us and begin to make devils submit to Jesus. This is what I believe the Lord is calling us to do. And I say this and I illustrated for you a moment ago in Matthew chapter 8 where the people saw these men set free and all of a sudden it disturbed their normalcy. It disturbed what they understood to be common. They said, we were all used to, you know, these two guys being nutty and crazy. It's just the way it was. And Jesus reveals his kingdom. His kingdom falls on these men. The devil is destroyed. And the men are set free and people push it away. It's been too common and too normal for people in this world to continue to be destroyed, not only by sickness and not only by disease and not only uh, by torment and oppression, but also by religion. The religious system is this. It's man-made rules that not even they themselves can live by. And the world, and I believe the church could testify, and the world is at ends with people who say they belong to God, but their witness and their testimony reveal otherwise. How many of you have social media? Raise your hand if you have social media. 
I don't care what it is, Facebook, Instagram. You have social media, right? And on there it says, oh, I'm a believer. Oh, I belong to God. Oh, I'm Christian. Oh, I'm this. Oh, I'm that. And then the stuff that gets reposted is completely ungodly. It's completely un unchristian. It has nothing to do with Jesus. That's just a fraction of what I'm talking about. You go home or you go behind closed doors and you yell at your wife or you, you verbally abuse your children or, or you're addicted to, to something. You're addicted to some kind of thing. And yet we belong to God. The representation of what the church has become in the eyes of the world is a people that have a God that is completely powerless. Say, where is your God? Where is this God that you said that would heal this person of this disease? Where is this God that you said uh, that, that this person would be, would be changed because I went to church once and they prayed and nothing happened. This is how the world scoffs and mocks the church. You see, the only way that we can be the body of Christ that we are called to be is first by surrendering everything of us under the lordship of Jesus. I said surrendering everything of us under the lordship of Jesus. And secondly, it's this. It's by revealing this king and his kingdom to this world. We sang a song just a moment ago that, that talked about that very thing, about revealing God and that God is here and that God is with us. And so, like I said, I've been reading the Gospels the last few days and I've noticed something about Jesus. And that is this, is that everywhere he went, there was evidence of his father's authority. Amen. Does your Bible read the same as mine? Everywhere he went, there was an evidence of the Father's authority. There was power and there was love to all who he encountered. And so again, this looked like blind eyes opening, deaf ears hearing, those with the disease, leprosy, completely being healed and washed clean, those with demonic oppression, completely set free. And his mandate for his disciples was this, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 7. As you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, for freely you have received, freely give. How many of you are a believer in this house today? How many of you believe in Jesus? Raise your hand. I need to see it. You believe in Jesus, okay? Listen to this. The kingdom of heaven lives inside of your heart. The kingdom of heaven is always near. The kingdom of heaven is readily available no matter where we go. It's always with us, church. It's more than just a proverb or a song or a verse. The kingdom of heaven is inside of your life, burning and waiting to get out to be revealed to somebody. John 14 and verse 11 says this, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus is saying any one of you that has faith and that believes that he is the Son of God, that he is the revelation of God's Son in this world, will do what Jesus did and even greater things shall you do because you have faith in him. This is exactly what the word says. I didn't twist it. I didn't misinterpret it. This is exactly what it means. And so Jesus makes this relationship with himself one that is so easily attained, church. How many of you know what unconditional love is? That means that there's no prerequisite, there's no condition too bad or too great. And there's nothing that could separate you from attaining the love of God. This is the Savior that we serve. There is nothing, nothing, nothing. I don't care what the skin color is. I don't care what nationality you are. I don't care how bad your family history is. In fact, I don't care if you're a murderer, you're a liar, you're a cheater, you're a thief, you're, you're, you're a prostitute. None of those things matter. Jesus said that anyone could come to him. My Bible tells me that these young men that said yes to him, that, that dropped their nets to follow him, had no training whatsoever. Did you know that? They had no training whatsoever, and yet God used them for signs, wonders, and miracles. They, had, they didn't have the name of an apostle. They didn't have a name of a pastor or an evangelist. They were believers. 
There were people that believed in this God that they saw walking next to them. There were people that simply had a belief in Jesus. He said, if anyone who has faith in me, they will do what I have been doing. So you could flip that around and say that if nothing is being done, then do you really have faith? I want you to notice something that these two verses reveal to us, and that is this. First thing that Jesus said for us to declare was that the kingdom of heaven was near, church. It means that he is living inside of your heart, and he's given you an anointing to reveal him to this world. This is such a wonderful promise for us because not only did Jesus want to save you, but he wants to use you to make an impact in this world. Everyone say amen. Because right now the enemy just entered into the room and he's trying to disqualify every single one of you from being a vessel used by God. Because that was probably the weakest amen that I heard all morning when I said that God wants to use you too. Well, that's fine. It's too late now. <laughs> you missed your chance. Jesus says in his word, whatever is bound on earth would be bound in heaven and whatever is loosed upon the earth would be loosed in heaven. But sometimes we get so caught up, church, in our shortcomings. Sometimes we get so caught up in our struggles. Sometimes we get so caught up in the thing that we do not do well that we cannot believe that this God would want to ever interact with us. That this living God, this holy, this pure, this righteous God would ever want to do anything through our life or in our life. And it's this struggle where the enemy just tries to torment us because that is this, at the moment that we believe this lie, not only is the devil winning, but we are closing heaven and the revelation of who Jesus is to this world. The moment that you cannot believe that God wants to use you, you are shutting Jesus out from your world. Think about that. The moment that you say, well, Pastor Duke, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. But the blood on Calvary was enough. The blood of Jesus was enough. But Pastor Duke, you know, I haven't got it all figured out. Neither did the disciples. They were cutting off people's ears. Jesus had to even call one of them Satan. Amen. Are you getting a belief in your life about yourself? I hope that you are just for a second because it's going to get better. But this is where the struggle begins because we're more apt to believe in what we are incapable of doing and less likely to believe that God, who has no limitations, could work through our life. And not only does this unbelief creep into our serving the Lord, but it also creeps into our society. Because without the revelation of Jesus through the demonstration of the Holy Spirit and God's love for this world, all of a sudden we have partitioned off and we have wrote off the world into condemnation and judgment without God. I said without the revealing and the demonstration of the work of God in our midst, we have already preconceived that they can't get in. Oh, well, they're a part of that group. No hope for them. Oh, well, they believe that. No hope for them. And this is not who Jesus has called us to be. If you and I fail to believe that the Lord could use us, we will close the door of access to those not yet believing, and we will have kept them in the dark. Jesus said in his word, shine your light before who? All men. Shine your light before all men that they may what? See your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. But if there's no light shining, it's dark. If there's no light shining, oppression takes over. If there's no light shining, sickness and disease and, and pain and all the things that the world is experiencing just continues to grow. If you do not pull out a weed, it will germinate and it will create other weeds. But the access that my Father has given me, the access that the Holy Spirit has given you, church, is something that is great. It is something that's beautiful. It's something that's powerful that he wants us to use. It is something so powerful, church, that it looks like using a person that had nothing to do with God for God. An example of this looks like the Apostle Paul, 
who had just finished murdering Stephen. In front of the whole city in the book of Acts, he had just finished leading a regime of people to stone this man, to kill him for his beliefs. He was the first martyr in the gospel. And the Bible says that it was just after that that this Paul had this experience on a Damascus road where he went blind. And all of a sudden, he heard somebody talking to him, and that person was Jesus. And he's saying, why are you persecuting me, Paul? And he's saying, I'm not persecuting you. I'm on your team. And he's like, no, you're not. You're killing my people. And he has this massive encounter with the Lord, and the Lord tears the scales off his eyes, and all of a sudden, this Paul began to see. But he began to see from God's heart. He began to see from God's perspective, from God's view. And this Paul all of a sudden walks into church one day and the church goes, oh my gosh, it's that killer. It's that crazy guy, man. We just saw what he did to Stephen, man. I don't want to have anything to do with security. Get this guy out of the church, man. He's a nut. And the apostles are looking at Paul and Paul's looking at the apostles and he's like, no, trust me. I, I turned to Jesus and they're saying, yeah, that's what you said before. No, for real. I, I've turned to Jesus and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit began to well up inside of Paul and his testimony all of a sudden began to be revealed that he wasn't just a person anymore. He wasn't the murderer that he was, but he had been transformed by the power of God. And the crazy thing was this, was it took the church so long to believe this. If you can't believe that your crazy neighbor I don't know if they're crazy or not. But if you can't believe that your neighbor or the guy in your neighborhood that's always blasting the music loud at night or the coworker that just gets on your last nerve, if you cannot believe that they cannot be transformed, then what do you really believe? I posted on social media the other day, I said, some of you all believe that God's going to rapture you, but you, but you don't believe in divine healing. You believe that God's going to just shoot you up to heaven, but you can't believe that heaven could be here on earth? Come on now. I said heaven could be here on earth, church. How many of you know that the will of God is to see the lost saved? Amen? How many of you know that it is the will of God to see sickness and disease defeated by the name of Jesus? How many of you know... That God is looking for more ways to get you into heaven than to keep you out because of his great love for you and I. Amen. I said amen. amen. We're the ones that put all the limitations in the way. We're the ones that put all the restrictions on the gospel that were never there. We're the ones that say you've got to dress a certain way, act a certain way, walk a certain way to enter into the house of God. And if you don't fit the mold, then maybe you don't belong. 2 Peter 3, 9 says that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness, but he rather he is patiently waiting for everyone to come to repentance. Jesus' church was not so hell-bent on making people repent as much as he was focused on revealing the Father's love. How many times do you see Jesus in the word of God make people repent? The only ones that he ever talked to that way were those that thought that they knew God. They were the Pharisees and they were the Sadducees. They were the people that claimed to know this God, but yet they lived nothing like him. He said, they worship me with their lips, but yet their hearts are far from me. The Father's heart is to reveal the Holy Spirit to this world. It's to reveal who his nature is to this world in every situation. The times that Jesus called people to repentance were those times, like I said, that they thought that they knew what God's will was and he had to make that correction. They said it was unlawful to heal on the Sabbath and Jesus revealed the Father's heart by healing a man with a crippled hand. You see, they were trying to put a rule. They were trying to put some kind of religious order, some kind of routine in the way and Jesus said, what's easier to say? It's unlawful to heal on the Sabbath or just to heal. <laughs> and he revealed the Father's heart. 
when they questioned his authority and they criticized his power, saying that it was demonic, he said that a kingdom uh, uh, divided against itself could not stand. He said, you're either for me or you're against me. You're either gathering or you're scattering. Reverend uh, Denny Brake says this. He says, if a savior leaves you as you are and where you are, from what has he saved you? The question of the hour that I have for you this morning is this, is for what purpose have you been saved? Is your purpose to simply sit in a building on Sundays and Wednesdays because anybody in the world, saved or unsaved, could accomplish this? Amen? Or is your purpose to believe in the Son of God, to believe in the authority of His Father and in the power of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you that is greater than any spirit outside of you? outside of you? Is the body of Christ supposed to be a people that shrink back at the sight of adversity or be a people that advance the kingdom of God? Is the body of Christ supposed to be a people that advance the kingdom of God by taking it to the people that are hurting, that are broken, that are abused, that have had lives shattered by sickness and pain, uh, people that are confused, uh, you know, ridden by abandonment of loved ones? I believe that God is calling his people, church, to reveal the kingdom on this earth as it currently exists in heaven as it currently exists in heaven God is calling his children to reveal the beauty of this Savior Jesus who loves you despite your failures who loves you despite your heritage who loves you despite your nationality who loves you despite if you're talented or not despite the fact if you call yourself qualified or not the Spirit of the Living God is calling us to reveal this Savior who has transformed our lives to the lost to the destitute, to the forsaken, to the abandoned, to those without hope, to those who have given up on God, to those who question God, to those who even hate religion, to those who the Bible says will not inherit the kingdom of God. To these he has called us to reach. To these he has called us, church, to reveal the gospel. I said to these. But when the enemy shows up and he whispers in your ear, What's going to happen when you pray and nothing happens? What's going to happen when you believe and it seems that God didn't do as he said he would? What happens when you try to open your mouth about God but they question everything that you say? The word of God says that you sow and that some water but God brings the increase, church. I need to just... Expose the lie of the enemy, and that is this, is that sometimes you think, well, God, I prayed and nothing happened, so therefore I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to live in fear, God. I'm not going to say a word. I, 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 I don't know, God, because it doesn't seem like it works. And if he says, do it again, what are you supposed to do? Do it again. And if he says, keep praying until something happens, then keep praying. How many of you have read Matthew chapter 7? Ask, seek, knock. Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be opened. A few verses later, Jesus talks about this persistent widow, this persistent woman who kept going to the judge and she said, hey, I got to have, I got to have freedom. I got to have victory from my adversary. He keeps, he keeps, he keeps bothering me. It seems like he keeps winning. And the Bible says because of her persistence, the unjust judge gave her favor and he granted her favor from her adversary. You see, church, we can't be those that just give up after the first try. This kingdom that we serve is not a kingdom of participation trophies. <laughs> That's a whole nother debate. But this kingdom is one where Jesus is going to either say, well done, good and faithful servant, or he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. It's a message, church, where he says simply in his gospels, you're either for me or you're against me. You are either living this out or you're not living it out. There's no gray area. The book of Revelation talks about that famous verse that we all know. He says, because you are neither hot nor you're cold, but because you're lukewarm, I will what? I will spit you out of my mouth. I hope you're receiving the gospel today. The word of God says that some sow and some water, but God brings the increase. That means that the pressure's not on you. I said, the pressure's not on you. All you were supposed to do is be obedient to his voice. If he told you to pray, pray. If he told you to sow, sow. If he told you to bless, bless. 
If he told you to help, help. If he told you to share the truth, he will fill your mouth with the words. But it's not up to you whatever the outcome shall be. I can't make anybody choose Jesus. I can't make that decision for them. All I am called to do is to sow and to water and God will bring the increase. It's up to heaven and I believe church that the Lord's purpose will not fail. If someone isn't healed the first time that you lay hands on them, then continue to be obedient to what the spirit has told you to do. If someone doesn't want to give their heart to Christ the first time that you ask them, keep praying for them. You see, our work as the body of Christ isn't finished until we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And so your purpose in the kingdom is to reveal the king. Your purpose isn't to be the king, it's to simply point this world to the name above all names and be a vessel used for his glory. And it all starts and ends with belief. Do you believe? Do you believe? I can tell you right now that the only thing that will disqualify you from revealing the kingdom on this earth is a person who simply does not believe. Those that Jesus called to follow him had no training to be involved in miracles. They had no skills that made them qualified. They simply had a relationship with him. They simply opened their hearts to believe that he was who he said he was. This is the wonderful news of Jesus. And I believe that the world church is at a point where it no longer wants to listen to sound doctrine. Amen. I said the world doesn't want to listen to sound doctrine anymore. They don't want to listen to the truth. All people want to hear is what they want to believe. But how different would the gospel presentation be if we revealed the Father's love to all we encountered? Not just those that we think are validated to stand in church next to us. Because the last time I checked, my Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever, everybody say whoever, would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Donna Maddox said this, we're called to be witnesses and not lawyers. You see, the best witness is the Holy Spirit. It, it's who he is and it's what he does. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. You will receive what? <laughs> that was the most powerless power I've ever heard. You will receive what? Power. Kind of. You will receive what? When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my, you will be my what? What does a witness do? They tell of the encounter that they've had. They say, you know what? I met this Jesus. I know he's real. I have a fire burning inside of my heart and I don't even know how to explain it. But guess what? I know he's real. And all of a sudden this light just begins to turn so bright that you begin to reveal Jesus wherever you go. You sit down in a restaurant and you see that waitress and she looks burdened. She looks tired or you see that guy, he looks weary. He looks broken in his heart. And all of a sudden you become a light that they need to see. You reveal the king and the kingdom right there in that moment. You say, what's, what's the matter? What's, what's going on? Oh, you don't know. I've had, a, I've had a crazy day. Well, guess what? I, I have a crazy, awesome God. He's ready to meet your needs. You see, they don't have to come to church first to receive a miracle, church. I said, they don't have to get in here first to receive the love of God. You don't just love them when they show up here and you hate them out there. You stare them up and down in the line at the grocery store or you, you prejudge them or you pre-think something about them while they're out there. No, you love them out there. I said, you love them out there. That's what Jesus did. You will be his witnesses. In Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Paul says this. I love this version. It's the Passion Translation. 1 Timothy 1 and 15. I can testify that the word is true. This is the murderer talking. Paul, he says, I can testify that the word is true and deser deserves to be received by all. For Jesus Christ came into the world to bring sinners back to life. He says, even me, the worst sinner of all. He says, yet I was captured by grace so that Jesus Christ could display through me the outpouring of his spirit as a pattern to be seen for all those who would believe in him for eternal life. Oh, man. 
I was captured by grace. Grace tells me, church, that I didn't earn it. I couldn't have bought my way into this kingdom. I couldn't have bought my way into the Father's love, but yet he gave it for me, and he gave it for you. That's what grace is, and this is what Paul's saying. He says, I was captured by grace so that Jesus could display through my life the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the presence of God. You see, I want you to believe in it enough of Jesus for yourself, but I certainly want you to believe that Jesus is enough for others. The last instruction Jesus gave his disciples in Mark chapter 16 was this. And he says to them, as you go into all the world, preach openly the wonderful news of the gospel to the entire human race. Whoever believes the good news and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe the good news will be condemned. Verse 17, he says, And these miracles and signs will accompany those who believe. They will drive out demons in the power of my name, and they will speak in tongues. And they will be supernaturally protected from snakes and from drinking anything poisonous. And they will lay hands on the sick and heal them. The world is waiting for that church to arise once again. I said, the world is waiting for this church to arise once again. It doesn't operate under their own wisdom, with their own eloquence or their own words, but through a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe the Bible makes it plain and clear for us, and that is God's purpose for us is to believe so that there can be a witness greater than a simple invitation to church. So that there can be a witness greater than letting people know that our church is, is cool or our church does nice things. So that there could be a witness that testifies of the goodness of God greater than the building that we gather in. And as I close this morning, I believe that there is someone in here today that has had sleepless nights and you don't know why. And you've been completely burdened and you've been completely heavy, but you have no idea what the solution is. I want you to receive this Jesus today. If that's you, as you walk towards this altar, in church, you could bow your heads right now. As you walk towards this altar, I want you to believe that God is the answer. I'll say it one more time. There is someone in here who has had sleepless nights and you do not know why. I want you to come to this altar because I believe the Lord is about to demonstrate his spirit. There is someone in here who is battling sickness in your body right now. There's disease. I want you to come up here this morning because I believe that your healing is about to happen. Make your way. Don't worry. You don't have to wait for me. Don't even wrestle with the voice that's speaking to you inside of your head right now. There's someone in here today that has been stricken with fear to believe that God could even use you. Then I want you to come. I said, then I want you to come. And you want to believe that God is going to destroy those who have caused you to fear. I believe there's someone in here that has suffered a great deal of emotional pain. Please make your way and believe that Jesus can heal you. I believe that there's someone in here that wants to see your kids saved. Now's the time. I believe that there is someone in here that needs the freedom to live in Christ. I want you to come because the Holy Spirit is here today and that he is the answer so that Jesus Christ can display through me the outpouring of his spirit as a pattern to be seen for all those who would believe in him for eternal life. If any of those things apply to you, I want you to come right now, church. Don't be ashamed. Don't be worried about what your neighbor thinks as I ask you to stand to your feet as well. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I believe that there's more. Maybe I didn't call out something that you're dealing with right now, but if you need Jesus, then just make your way. I said, if you need Jesus, just make your way. Prayer team, would you come? Sister Rosemary, would you come? Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, we believe in you today. Everyone in this room, I'm just praying right now. Father, we believe 
I said, Lord, we believe in you today. I said, Jesus, we believe in you right now. We believe in the power of the anointing of the presence of God. We believe, Lord, that you are greater, God, than any sickness. We believe, Lord, that you are greater than any disease. We believe today, Lord Jesus, God, that you're greater than any fear, that you're greater, God, than any, Father God, Lord, just a thing, Lord, that the enemy would try to plant inside of our lives, Lord, and we are trusting right now in the name of Jesus, God, that, Father God, every single person, Lord, that is making their way to this altar right now, Father God, would receive exactly what they came here for. In Jesus' name, Sister May, would you come? In the mighty name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, begin to touch and begin to bless. Holy Spirit, begin to do a work, Lord, that only you can do. To the glory of your name. To the glory of your name. To the glory of your name. I said, to the glory of your name. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we bless you right now. Holy Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, we just thank you right now, God. Holy Spirit, we ask right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would begin to do what only you can do. What only you can do. There is no sickness or disease, God, that is greater than you. Lord, there is no pain so deep, God, that is greater than you. You said in your word, Father God, that every single promise, God, would be fulfilled, God. Because as we send forth your word, Father God, it will not come back void. I said, as we send forth your word, God, it will not come back void, Lord. And so in the name of Jesus, God, I ask for divine healing, Lord. I ask, Lord Jesus, for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit, God, in such a powerful way, Lord Jesus, upon every single person, Father, upon every single need in the house today, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, do the work. Holy Spirit, do the work. Holy Spirit, manifest yourself. Holy Spirit, just begin to make that thing happen, Lord. I don't know what it is, God, but I know that you do. And so, Jesus, I glorify your name right now. I glorify your name, Jesus. I glorify your name. I glorify your name, Jesus. I glorify your name. I glorify your name, Holy Spirit. I glorify your name. Jesus, we bless you. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. Join us next time for another uplifting message. If you'd like to support this ministry and the reaching out of others, you have the opportunity to give at rockofagesaog.org. 